Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to a special virtual program of the Commonwealth Club. My name is Michael Boskin. I'm the Tully Friedman Professor of Economics and Ho Wolford Family Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. I'm also the president of the Caret Foundation, a Bay Area-based foundation that is uh, uh, that is a strong has a strong interest in preparing students for the future. Caret has been a longtime funder of the Commonwealth Club, supporting its role as a public forum where all ideas can be discussed in an environment of civility and mutual respect. The foundation is proud to support the Commonwealth Club's efforts to launch a civics education initiative and see this topic as critical in a time when civics education has been especially, is especially relevant and has been steadily declining or even removed from our education system, both K through 12 and university. The challenges our country, uh, our country is facing, and indeed all countries are facing around the world as a result of the global pandemic, provide an opportunity to engage students in the story of America. Since its founding, our country has overcome other significant, even worse challenges than we confront today. The Great Depression, World War II, the Civil War among them. And it's managed to serve as a beacon, for free, of, a beacon of freedom and hope around the world. Today's virtual program will look at how this difficult period can possibly be harnessed to boost civic education, helping K through 12 students understand the key principles of American democracy and its civics pillars that will help the country to rebuild in the wake of the pandemic. As many of our leaders are want to say, Democracy is not a spectator sport, and informed citizenry is vital. The foundation is pleased, indeed honored, to help the club kick off this new initiative and support today's program. Indeed, it's a special privilege to me to introduce and turn the program over to our moderator for today's program, Louise Dubay, the executive director of iCivics one of the country's leading civics education organizations. It's a personal pleasure for me, especially because a close personal friend, former Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor was deeply involved in the creation and expansion of iCivics. So Louise, let me turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Boskin. We really appreciate your leadership on this issue. Thank you also for this inspiring introduction and to linking it to our country's future. And thank you to the Corette Foundation for sponsoring today's program. Finally, thank you to the Commonwealth Club for bringing us together to virtually to discuss this important topic at this critical time. My name is Louise Jubé and I am the executive director of iCivics. iCivics is a nonprofit organization that reimagines civic education to prepare every new generation of young people for thoughtful and active civic engagement. iCivics provides nonpartisan civic education resources to more than 7 million students, grades 4 through 12 in all 50 states every year. We're known for free educational games that simulate civic processes. Uh, you can go to icivics.org, don't go now, but you can go later and try your hand at winning a national election by playing our win the White House game, for example. Uh, in addition, because we think it's so very important for our country's future to prepare students for their civic life, we have formed a coalition of 120 member organizations called Civics Now. And th all of those organizations have banded together to make civics a priority in schools. You can find out more at civxnow.org. I'm pleased to be the moderator for today's program to help the Commonwealth Club launch its new civics education initiative, which is very exciting. An important note of housekeeping before we get started. If you have questions for me or for any of our distinguished uh, panel of guests, uh, please use the YouTube chat function and all of your questions will be relayed to me and I will try to get to as many as I can during our time together. Now, I would like to introduce our distinguished panel of guests. First, Anthea Hardick, 
the Elizabeth McMillan Director of the Smithsonian National Museum of American History and the very first woman to hold this position since the museum opened in 1964. Next, Bill Deverell, joining us from Los Angeles, where he is a professor of history at the University of Southern California, director of the Huntington USC Institute on California and the West, and very relevant to this conversation, the founder of the Los Angeles Service Academy, which provides students an opportunity to engage with civic institution in greater LA. And lastly, but not least, the uh, Robert Pondicio, Senior Fellow at the Thomas B. Fordham Institute and Senior Advisor to the Democracy Prep Public Schools, a network of high-performing charter schools based in Harlem, New York, and the author of the excellent book, How the Other Half Learns. I could not think of a better group to bring together to discuss this incredibly challenging time for our country and how just maybe this is the perfect time to propel our nation to strengthen civic education. With that, first I want to begin by turning to the two historians on our panel. We're living in such a difficult time with the pandemic, but it's a very civic moment, isn't it, Bill and Anthea? We're social distancing, but our success will greatly depend on our civic fabric and our resilience. Can you tell us a little bit about what moments in history we should look to, to find inspiration, to understand better and to form a path forward? Anthea, would you like to get us started? Oh, well, thank you everyone. And thank you for the Commonwealth Club, uh, Louise, Bill, and Robert, it's great to be with you. Um, historians being historians, we practiced a little bit in, before we uh, joined you. And I'm gonna ask Bill to, uh, to kick it off and then I'm gonna follow if you don't mind. Uh, well, thank you so much, uh, Louise, and um, my best to my fellow panelists. It's a, it's a privilege and an honor to be with you all. Um, but Louise, I think you hit the nail on the head with the comment about social fabric. Um, the social fabric that holds us together as a nation um, is obviously under stress. And we've seen stress in the social fabric before. The most glaring example is the Civil War. But in the, the big examples of the Great Depression leading into the Second World War, the notion of civic community and pulling uh, together was probably as vehement and important as perhaps we've seen in the generations since. So we do have moments in the past where the tensions in the society are profound. And we always have moments where those tensions provoke the, the best and worst of us. And so our challenge is to try to harvest some good uh, that connects us all, or perhaps makes new connections between us all. So I'll stop there and hand it over back to my colleague. Thanks, Bill. And we've also, of course, been thinking a lot about the pandemic, the, la the last pandemic of the last century. And I think it'd be great at some moment if we want to get into that and the lessons we learned from 1918 through 1920. And um, Bill's thought a lot about that as well. But there are certainly, I think we're all feeling these resonances with the past, surely. and. For me, we need to begin with accepting the richness and the complications of history. And I think that's because, as I've written, this pandemic reveals our cultural, our racial, our socioeconomic seismology in ways that very few things can. The impacts to communities of color um, who are disproportionately impacted by the uh, by COVID-19, as well as many of them fulfilling essential service roles is just but you know one of those resonances. And I'm sure I'm not the first historian to think of Upton Sinclair's in the jungle when we're you know hearing about the uh, what's happening in the meat processing world. Um, I also think that we're historians are finding an, this anti-intellectual kind of anti-historical, anti-scientific thinking and positioning. There are long threads. Of, of such thinking um, in the United States. Um, if you think of the Know Nothing Party in the 1850s of you know, mostly white Protestant males uh, who of course could vote, um, 
sort of anti-immigrant and anti-Catholic. And we look back on that as one of the key kind of churning moments leading up to the Civil War, along of course with slavery. But we also can learn from that, right? The emphasis on science, the emphasis um, on uh, notions of the scientific grounding for our communal health, what, I, what I've called our civic health recently, um, is, in, is a, in essence an enlightenment ideal, right? That we're going to base our shared uh, future um, on a shared understanding uh, with the best science available um, of our capacity to come together as people. So, um, you know, the looking in the mirror of history right now, I, I think is, um, is incredibly important, uh, as well as just, the, I think our greater understanding of our capacity as a nation to come together. And as Bill said, uh, especially through studying certain moments where we see those historic echoes and feel them uh, in our own kind of radar or seismographs. You have touched on so much. Um, so anti-intellectualism, <laughs> equity issues, um, um, anti so, so many of our deep divisions uh, so let, let's think about this and stay here for a moment, I think, mm -hmm. because these are real issues, right? Um, and what is it that we could do as a nation um, through education, through civic education to address some of these issues um, and to foster uh, the common good or coming together that you suggest is needed? A anybody? But Anthea, if you want to start us out. Well, I'm sure I don't want to talk too much, but I do think that the um, the accepting of the past, you know, James Baldwin wrote in The Fire Next Time that um, to accept one's past, one's history is not the same thing as drowning in it, right? It's learning how to use it. And I do, I do think that the, the, the power of history education, of social studies, of, of, of civics in the way that I think we on this, on this panel believe in their power of animating um, that shared knowledge is for me the grounding of it. You know, of course you're asking a historian, um, but um, I do think again that rich understanding of the complexities of the beauties and the horrors, um, but of also the perseverance as Bill said, um, is a critical way to, um, to help us move forward with a shared understanding rather than as Baldwin called it, the um, the invented past. So yeah. there's a, there's a, I think we're, it behooves us all to try and share that uh, history in really profound and meaningful ways. Robert, do you? Um, sure, and, and at the risk of, of sounding a dour note, um, yeah, as, as the, uh, the, the, the token classroom teacher here, part-time I'll be, you know, what can education do? Well, we could get started. Uh, to, to put it bluntly, um, I don't think it's possible to overstate the degree to which the civic role of public education is the forgotten role of, of, of public education. Uh, I, I sometimes joke ruefully that Horace Mann went to his grave without ever having once uttered the phrase college and career ready. Um, if, you, if you speak to Americans you know, casually about their ambitions for their children, uh, for for their education, almost without exception, they cite the private ends of education, college, career, get a good job. Uh, the, the, the public dimension of education, which was the founding purpose of, of public education, rarely comes up. And, and this is not merely anecdotal. Um, a few years ago, uh, just did, I did a kind of you know, uh, back of the envelope study, as it were, where pulled the mission statements of the 100 largest school districts in America just to look at, you know, okay, when, when the men and women who run our local school system sit down and ask themselves this question, okay, what do we do here? What's our purpose? This generally doesn't come up, and I won't bore you with the details, but for the vast majority of American school systems, the, 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 the word civic or citizenship does not appear. The word America or American literally does not appear, over for 100. What does show up is what you'd expect, college and career readiness. Uh, you know, the word global comes up, or when the word citizen comes up, it tends to be uh, in terms of global citizenship or whatnot. So again, the risk of being too dour when you ask what can education do, 
uh, well, for starters, we could remind ourselves that this is why we send our children to a place called school. Bill, any, anything to add from a historic perspective about how we use education? Um, it's, all, uh, it's all fascinating to contemplate right now. I think the, what the pandemic is doing is, um, it's obviously creating some fissures, uh, clear fissures in our society, but I think more powerfully, it's revealing the fissures that are already there. Um, and so it's just um, a kind of bright light on trouble in the land. And I, I agree with Robert in the sense that the public square, however we define the public square and however we uh, ask our public education system to sustain it, uh, it's ailing. Um, and in the pandemic, we have this curious irony, which is we're, we're sent away from the public gatherings because we need to be away from them and we need to be away from one another right now. And yet we want to make certain that the public square is alive and well when we return to some kind of yeah. previous uh, pre-pandemic life. Um, but I think we best consider that returning to an ailing public square is not going to be enough. We've got to return to a commitment to making it far more vibrant and not quite sure how you do that. Um, I think Robert's sensibilities about public education's mission and obligation to society at large is absolutely part of it. Um, but I think we'd better recommit ourselves to strengthening those bonds between us all now that we see them stretched uh, into our quarantines. So Robert is, is uh, positing a, a little bit of a tension between individual families and their hopes and needs for their students and what might be useful for the country to come together. How, how do we resolve that? Hey, what, what, what is the role of uh, public schools in that tension? I mean, I can, I can jump in there uh, and, and just start us off. These two ideals are not necessarily at cross purposes, you know, the public and the private. Um, in fact, they're complementary. If you, if you want to get wonky about it, uh, you could look at the last 20, 30 years of education policy and, and the signals that we have sent to teachers and schools and districts in this country about what matters, you know, the, the old bromide about, you know, what, what gets measured gets done. Well, what gets measured and done is math and reading and not a lot else. Um, now, you know, you could make a, an opposing argument that since those things, uh, you know, uh, high stakes testing, as it were, hasn't exactly created this, you know, full flowering of, of proficiency in math and reading, that maybe we should be careful what we wish for and that, the last thing we should wish for is some measure of accountability around teaching um, uh, or valorizing civics and history, for example. But regardless, what is undeniable, and we have very fresh data to point to here, is, is that not only is, uh, is, is civics uh, the forgotten mission of, of education, it's the, it's the forgotten subject. Uh, it, it, it look no further than NAEP scores, which just a few weeks ago, um, the NAEP stands for National Assessment of Educational Progress, often referred to as the nation's report card. Well, if, if, um, if we are used to thinking of reading and math as, as uh, you know, weaknesses in American education, well, compared to civics, those things are robust. From, from memory, I don't have the data in front of me, I think fewer than one out of five uh, students are proficient or better. That in, in according to NAEP civics and history. So as much as a crisis, we're used to thinking of reading and math and education, educational performance at large as, as, as a crisis. Well, what's worse than a crisis? Whatever the word you prefer, that's, that's the state of play for our students' uh, accomplishment in, in civics and history. Uh, Bill, do you think this is a crisis? Oh, yeah, I do. Yeah, um, I think, I mean, how you solve this uh, is gonna take so many shoulders at the wheel um, across every given sector of the society. But I do, where, where I come in with my own collegiate students um, insofar as teaching what we could call civics is some kind of balance between the fabric, social and otherwise that holds us together but also to be able to use history as a tool by which you get students to understand that we're not always together and that there are different stories in the larger story of this place and that there are conflicts 
um, and sometimes horrific conflicts and to remind them of that and that somehow that entire canvas of historical learning um, is itself the, the public dialogue about the past and our future. And I think the level of engagement with the major stands of civics education is uh, very poor. And I would like to see a great deal more of it, of course. So you're calling in some ways for a blending of history and civics together so that there is a, a um, broader understanding. Uh, let me ask any of you, uh, mm -hmm. how do you do that? How do you um, make sense of history when students don't know much of it um, and make a connection to their role in our society today? Well, I, th I think that the context is key. We all don't need a 1840 sense of civics or a 1957 sense of civics. We really need a, a, a near mid 21st century sense of civics. And I, I think that the understanding how um, the civitas, you know, the, our civic space, our civic obligations, our civic contracts with one another, that I believe that you're going to wear your mask and be careful. And if you're going to, if you have a fever, you're going to stay at home is the pandemic version, right, of that civic bond that brings us together. Um, but I do think having, helping people feel welcome into the history, to the grand experiment that is humanity or the, and the grand experiment that is the United States um, is certainly one of the ways that history is not something that happens um, in the past, as you know, not even past yet, according to Faulkner, um, but that they are making to see themselves as agents of change, that their history, their family's history, their people's history um, is part of the broader um, historical landscape, but really also part of the broader civic landscape um, of the nation is certainly one of the ways that I have always tried to connect um, and to really kind of privilege that and honor that individual and that community and that family history um, that they may not feel is, is important, that they may not feel is worthy, but that of course is part of, um, you know, very, obviously a democratic understanding of our history. But if we want democratic participation, then I think we're that kind of sense of welcoming and, um, and of acceptance and of honor of each individual story and their family story um, to be here and to be um, in this nation is, uh, is for me always a good place to start. Great, great. So this is no longer, uh, I'm just a bill. Uh, this is something more nuanced and complex, though it's probably the first thing everybody mentions to me. Robert, you are a classroom teacher. You told us that. Give me an example because I, I want that to make this. You're dating your, we're dating ourselves. You yeah, we are a little yeah, bit. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Yeah. I, I love 20, but I'm not. But, uh, so <laughs> can, you, uh, can you give us a little example, uh, some example, concrete sure. example of what civics looks like? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm a, a, a current classroom teacher, albeit a part-time one, and, and not lately, not since mid-March, we've been, um, uh, as everybody has been, um, teaching remotely. But uh, for, for the last couple of years on and off, I've taught a senior seminar class at Democracy Prep, which is a uh, charter high school in New York City, or a network of charter schools. And, as the name implies, Democracy Prep, it, it, it's a school that was founded with civic education at, at the core of its mission, unlike some of those schools and districts I cited earlier. So look, I mean, it's, it's, I've got the easiest job in the world in that regard. I'm teaching high school seniors, and, and the Constitution is our textbook, and events conspire weekly, if not daily, uh, to, to satisfy the mission, my mission for that class, which is for, for students to leave us, at least those seniors, understanding that the Constitution is not a dusty and dry 230-year-old document. It's very much at work in our lives today. So, so the challenge for teaching that class is, is not what to teach, but what not to teach. I mean, especially during times like this, especially during an election year, especially months after an impeachment, uh, there, there, are, there are no shortage of opportunities and controversial ones to remind students, look, you know, the, the, this is a document that very much uh, is, is alive in our lives today um, and, and puts the onus on them to think through these as informed future citizens and voters. 
So this gets very political very quickly, Robert. So, um, and um, we are a very divided nation. Um, is uh, that that disputes uh, information, facts, history? Um, how how does education uh, help us uh, with with these divisions? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm a um, an unrepentant disciple of a guy named E. D. Hirsch Jr., professor emeritus at the University of Virginia who um, some of our listeners or viewers may, may recognize as the author of Cultural Literacy and the founder of the Core Knowledge Foundation. Um, his, uh, his work has, has basically dictated the course of my work in education. And he is the guy who will tell you that, that cognition rests on a body of knowledge. So you know, at the very least, we have to start, uh, maybe this is the question I should have answered earlier, in terms of what should education do? Well, the very first thing after perhaps deciding that, well, yes, this is the business we want to be in, is, is dedicating ourselves to restoring our, our children's store of common knowledge um, you know, in history, in civics, uh, across the subject matter. Because to your very good point, Louise, unless we are, um, you know, unless we have the same general array of mental furniture, then, then we're not really well positioned to intelligently debate any of these things. So it ha you have to start there and, and, and young. So Bill, um, I know you are the founder of the Service Academy. Uh, Robert's talking about knowledge. Uh, how does knowledge uh, work with the Service Academy? And well, in a lot of ways, um, it's a kind of similar template. So the Service Academy has been around for a decade and the common knowledge we're trying to um, impart with the students is the infrastructural makeup of metropolitan Los Angeles. So. It's not uh, a canonical um, list of books or ideas per se, but it's similar in the sense that we work with uh, high school juniors on the cusp of voting, on the cusp of college, and on the cusp of driving. Um, and they come from all over Los Angeles, Los Angeles Basin from extraordinarily different and diverse backgrounds. However, um, their public service provision, uh, the water, the electricity, law enforcement, uh, transit, et cetera. There's great commonalities in that. And so teaching them about that, where does the water come from? Uh, what's the Los Angeles Police Commission do? How does the harbor work? What's the food bank do? It builds a common knowledge of uh, not only uh, how things work, but also experiential. So we put them out there. We, we work a shift at the food bank. We meet with the commissioner. We take a walking tour with uh, architectural critics. And that is a remarkably, it's, it's like what Robert said, best job in the world. I mean, it's tremendously exciting to watch 16 year olds from extraordinarily diverse and different backgrounds, uh, build a common set of knowledge with one another and realize that they're both different and also alike to one another. And so at the root of it is a hope that 15, 20, 30 years hence, some percentage of these kids will be back in decision-making and problem-solving roles here in greater Los Angeles. <laughs> and building upon what they learned when they were 16 and who they learned from. How are you adapting to the pandemic? Uh, are you working virtually now? Or? Yeah, we, um, we are recruiting our new class. We had a team meeting and thought, we're not gonna stop this. We're uh, gonna continue going on. Uh, we have research fellowships that we're offering for so, some of the kids in the summer mm -hmm. and we can do digital research. And then the online activities, we can do it. Uh, and in fact, this is the other thing that's probably not time enough to go into this, but. This, this revolution that's happening right now in education because of the pandemic, um, I really hope we're taking good notes and realizing how we can revolutionize certain learning patterns or even learning vehicles and platforms yeah. with our students across the grade levels. Um, there's a lot to learn about how this can be done better and more efficiently. We're doing pretty well, mm -hmm. actually I think pretty well, um, but boy, do we have a long way to go to make it uh, really hum. Yeah. It, if I may, I do. I, I know a little bit about Bill's work, and I think it's also using the city as as your as your classroom, right? Understanding how water and how power works in the Department of Water and Power, um, but also really understanding that they can have a role in this. Uh, at almost the end of almost every talk I give, I talk about the importance of of truly working in your community, volunteering as you can, giving as you can. Um, serving on a local commission, serving on um, uh, kind of raising your hand. And the, the energy that we find with our National Youth Summit or, 
we were involved in a project called Made by Us that targets um, using history organizations like the Smithsonian and, and many others across the nation to really um, help um, Gen Y and Gen Z um, understand not that the Pat you're the future because they're looking at us like well gee thanks it's a great job you know um, thanks for the mess you gave us um, but but really that they that that history is um, is a tool for them to use to shape their own lives and and their futures and civic participation and again caring about the civic health um, is is a critical way in on that. Um, we also see that the eagerness of, uh, of youth from all around the nation, we, we, we would have had hundreds of, of summer interns, um, but their eagerness to try and do virtual internships and even then to, again, their, their level of creativity with digital platforms because they are born digital, um, unlike us who have become digital, is astounding to me. And they, um, they're innovative, um, they find meaning in different ways than, than I certainly do, but I do think that the the more that we can honor that, the hope that they embody, um, and um, and certainly I think to ground them in a common um, a common set of vocabularies and a common set of 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 history is critical, but also to share the tools of the historian with them. You know, I, Bill has heard me say this, but. Um, I don't operate on brains, but I like to change minds. You know, the tools of a historian, critical reading, critical analysis, critical conversation, and allowing room uh, for of a convening in which you can have a discourse rather than an argument um, have long been the standbys, you know, of, of historians um, and, and based on scholarship, based on um, research that is, is devoted to a quest for truth. So there's a lot, but a lot that we can share across, uh, currently across generations, and then you're right, Bill, across these platforms, which we're all becoming, you know, so adroit at. A quest for truth. Uh, there's so much to pick up on. I don't know exactly. Uh, there's too much there, but a quest for truth is something that's come up in the questions from. Uh, our audience. And mm -hmm. um, I, I guess I could uh, summarize the question by saying that is not exactly how you would describe the media right now. Um, so <laughs> how would we help students um, make sense, uh, decipher truth from fiction? Robert, any help? Oh, um, well, yeah. I mean, to me, all roads, to a hammer, everything is a nail. And to me, all, all roads lead to, to at least some body of common knowledge. Uh, which I mean, I don't mean to, to, to call you out, Louise, but but just notice the way we even invoke that topic. You know, you kind of jokingly referred to that old schoolhouse rock video, "I'm Just a Bill," which those of us over the age of forty, you know, know by heart. So, so there's a tendency to kind of sniff at at the idea of oh, just learn the three branches of government, how a bill becomes law. But that stuff matters, right? In other words, if you don't understand the process then speaking of civic education, all you're really equipped to do is march in someone else's army. I mean, we love in civic education to talk about agency and, and, and activating student interest, but unless they understand the mechanics, then all they will ever able, be able to do is take direction from, from somebody else who understands the mechanics. So I, I don't wanna just elide that point. In other words, I think mm -hmm. it's, it's critically important uh, that 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 we develop skill, civic knowledge and civic skills, and not view them as 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 competing uh, in interest. You know, the, the the other significant tension, and I suspect this is what the questioner was really getting at in terms of the trustworthiness of of uh, of, of the media, is look, you know, the, the the other larger crisis here is that we are living through a time, and frankly, I think at the moment we're paying a price for our loss of faith in institutions. Yes. Uh, who do we trust now? Do we trust politicians? Do we trust government? Do we trust the news media? Uh, do we trust our, our schools and teachers? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I think you know, faith in all of these, these institutions is at historic lows. So at a time when um, you know, actionable information has never been more critical, uh, we are we are faced with with a lot loss of trust and faith in those who in different times we would turn to for a, a authoritative mm -hmm. information. So we we are not just doubly cursed; we are multiply cursed by that. Mm -hmm. 
I agree with that. I think the other the other um, yeah. the other option the, yeah. the other uh, pathway um, is just sitting right behind Robert there. I mean, look at that look at that library um, of books. I mean that that I think we need to remind students that there are bodies of knowledge out there that are yes. built upon one another every single generation, and it's not that you have to read them all by any means, but also but the notion is. There is some sleeves to be rolled up and some hard work to be done on these issues. And um, uh, I think just reminding students of that. So for instance, dis distilling uh, reliable news from unreliable news, um, unless it's, you know, when, when it gets uh, sinister and seductive and sounds like it might be right, that's where it's at its most dangerous. When it's so outlandish and it can be dismissed, we're on pretty good footing. But the sinister and seductive uh, just requires a quality of mind in terms of being skeptical. And so I agree that we're losing faith in institutions and it's terrible, I think. We need to be mindful. I think we even need to be skeptical. But uh, we also have to realize that there's a long tradition of institutions in this country that have both been served a uh, uh, good term, you know, done, done good, but also uh, not good. Um, and just be mindful of that and understand that long arc because um, it'll give students and others a deeper perspective and context as to how to make decisions and then empower young people. So by experience. So, you know, as wonderful as that Schoolhouse Rock Diddy was, and we can all, I can hear it now. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> having students participate in the processes, to see them up close and personal, to understand things, to model them, to create templates, those are useful exercises. Um. So it sounds to me as though um, you are all ar arguing for integration. So civic skills, civic knowledge, civic participation, all of these things to start with the knowledge and, and continue to nuance, um, but be rigorous. This all sounds pretty hard and we've obviously not done a great job. So um, how, how is this doable? Can, can, we, can we get back there? Well, let, let me make a suggestion, and I, I love talking about this uh, when, when the topic of civic education uh, comes up, not merely because I, I, I have a little bit of a fiendish pleasure in being a provocateur, uh, but it, it, it takes me back to the theme of, of the public role of, of, of education and, and why we have these things called schools. Um, I, I'll quote Yuval Levin, who um, said some years ago, uh, and forgive me, I'm going to read this quote. Um, Conservatives tend to begin from gratitude for what is good and what works in our society and then strive to build on it, while liberals tend to begin from outrage at what is bad and broken and seek to uproot it. Um, I don't know if you've noticed or not, but the undercurrent to some of the conversation that we've had today and always comes up in civic education is, uh, and I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth, we need to empower students, they need to have agency, they need to fix, be involved, etc. That, that implies an almost oppositional relationship uh, between um, our children and, and any number of public institutions. Uh, just seconds after, of course, we were just talking about how faith in them is, is, is waning. So you know, my, my challenge to civic educators, to all of us, is to remind ourselves that, look, we are public employees. You know, the, the, the taxpayers of this country pay our salaries and probably not to set their children in opposition to their community, their state, their country, et cetera. Um, but it makes people uncomfortable when we, when we talk about instilling anything like patriotism. That feels jingoistic to us. And I don't think that's, mm. that's right or accurate. Appropriate, um, but the, the, and I don't have the answer either. But I think that there's a profound challenge for those of us who are civic educators or just teachers in general. H how do we uh, create a clear-eyed view of this country, but one that is not uh, oppositional? Where, where I mean, to, to me, the great challenge for all of us is to create a sense of attachment. Uh, yes, we want our children to become civically engaged, civically active, to seek to fix what is broken, but why seek to fix it at all if you're not morally invested in, 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 in outcomes in this country? Hmm. And can I start with how you asked the question? I'd love to get back to what you just, number of things that you just said, but um, you asked the question, Louise, as how do we get back there? We never put our canoe back in the river. That water's gone. 
we can learn the course of the river. We can use maps to understand how the rivers changed or how we've dammed it or how the beavers reenacted it or you know whatever the impacts to the that cultural landscape. But I think we all need to be careful of how nostalgia operates here. Get back to which part of American history, really. Uh, um, get what back to the founding. Our get back to the founding ideals and making sure we continue to push them to include people who were never included or who were deemed chattel. Yes, keep on pushing that, right? And I do think um, Darren Walker of the Ford Foundation had a great quote about art that I love using to history and I, I don't have it in front of me, but he said, you know, do we need, um, do, you know, do we need art that challenges and um, reveals the ugliness um, um, you had classified it as um, liberal, a liberal stance and Darren uh, and I wouldn't. Um, so do we need like art like that that finds the, the horror and things? Or do we need art that reminds us of the beauty and the glory of our capacity? And his answer was we need both. And I think that we actually need both kinds of history too. We need that fullness and, and that richness. Um, we have to, I think, the, you know, again, embracing the truths of who we are as a nation um, doesn't mean it's conservative or liberal. It shouldn't. It should mean about embracing um, the complexities as both Bill and I have discussed um, so that we help America live up to those democratic ideals written into those founding documents. And I do think that's an important distinction to make as we move forward together, um, whether it be in a classroom that, in, your, in which you're teaching or in a, a museum in which I'm running, um, where before the pandemic, we would have had, you know, four or five million people a year come through and a lot of them school children. Um, and, um, and it is, it's challenging to get eighth graders to not just run from the ruby slippers to the Star Spangled Banner, you know, um, and to really kind of catch them in between, right? And to, uh, uh, to, to help them see um, the, the complexities of, you know, of the, the nation's past. So, I don't know, so, Bill, what do you think? Uh, I, I think you're right. Um, and I think that's how we tend to model our teaching and our research on a lot yeah. of those ideals and breathing new life and meaning into old documents and old visions. Um, yeah. I will, at the risk of being really pointy headed, I will um, mention Warren G. Harding here. Uh, Harding ran for now president. Now you're getting pointy headed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so Harding ran for president a century ago. Um, right, and he did, he did so on a platform to return to normalcy. Um, and that was probably a mistake. It got him elected. Um, but what that normalcy was and what he meant by it, I think there are lessons for us here because the 1920s, um, as roaring and potentially exciting as they would be for you know, lighting up metropolitan American culture, um, the 1920s brought us to the doorstep and then into the Great Depression. Um, and there's real lessons about what it is in this pandemic moment that we want to return to. Obviously, there's some clear things that we all desire, community and human touch and freedom to move about the landscape and engage in uh, business and economy, all those things, of course. But I think we have a real opportunity with our young people who are going to inherit whatever we return to, to really see what, they, what they're thinking about in terms of what kind of world we now can return to and when. Um, and it sounds lofty, but you know, if, if a school is anything, a school is a dialogue with young people. Um, and there's an opportunity, I think, here to both put historical perspective on the table. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't mind if my undergraduates knew who Warren G. Harding is. They probably don't. <laughs> I'd like them. You know, it makes sense to know about a president who ran 100 years ago on the uh, right after a global pandemic. Um, so there is an entree to perhaps move a conversation in productive ways. Right, so it'd Bill, be fascinating to, oops, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I said it just, it would be fascinating to look at the election of 1920 and 2020, which, you know, obviously we are, and we're, we're thinking about, and uh, the, my political historians and curators I'm 
on my staff are, are actively um, collecting, or they were when they could still go out in the field, right? But they're still continuing that, right? And being in touch with this moment. But a, but a pandemic election, we don't have a lot of those. We've, you know, we know what a board time election looks like. We have a sense of those contours. But um, 20 is fascinating, um, not just for Harding and his um, Make America Great and uh, Return to Normalcy, which I didn't, it wasn't that word kind of generated at that time? I don't know. No, it turns out uh, it, it's around. That's an it's urban no, myth. No, yeah, yeah he, no, no one uses it because it's a it's a hard, difficult, kind of silly, <laughs> silly word. But he didn't invent it. But he, yeah. oh yeah, but he liked it. Yeah, he liked it a lot. Yeah. Um, be, I think it would also for students understand that that too was contested, right? That that election was incredibly complicated. Um, uh, overtones of isolationism. Um, sure. Eugene V. Debs was in prison because sure. of the um, the expansion of of the policing state in World War One under the Alien and Sedition Act, and he ran for president as a socialist in 1920 and got a million votes from prison. Um, so, I mean, along with telling us the complicated history of socialism in the nation, but I do think that it's it's it is a um, it is a remarkable um, uh, kind of moment for us 100 years later, celebrating the centennial, the ratification of the 19th Amendment, um, allow, disbarring um, um, prejudice uh, against voters based on sex, um, not allowing women to vote, as you know, there's a difference. Um, but it is, it's, it's just a remarkable and rich year. And, and, you know, to your point as a classroom teacher, you know, bringing this forward when you only get to have these kind of interactions with your students is uh, must be really challenging as well. Yeah. But at the risk of belaboring the point, um, yeah. you know, we have a college teacher, historian, I teach high school. Uh, you got to start younger, right? In other words, there is, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm a, I, I was certified as an elementary school teacher. I spent most of my career teaching fifth grade in the South Bronx. Um, and I don't want to suggest that that's a window into American education at large, but there's no evidence, uh, to, at the risk of repeating myself, to suggest that we are taking any of this seriously in the formative younger ages. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And that's really where the battle, you know, in almost everything in education, that's where the battle is won and lost, is, right. is at the very young age. Yeah, so uh, it's, it just stay here for a second. It, it, so in the younger grades, we spent a great deal of time on literacy, which is obviously critical. We measure that. We assess a lot of that. Uh, we assess less of social studies or, or civics. Uh, should we be doing more of that? Uh, you could argue that one round or flat, as I think I alluded to this earlier. In other words, we, for the last 20 odd years, we have uh, valorized reading and math in this country almost to the point of fetishization. Uh, that said, it's hard to point to um, results on that NAEP test that I referred to earlier that anybody would, I think, reasonably dis describe as satisfying. So for all of the attention and airtime and, and, and earnest goodwill that has gone into improving literacy and math rates, we don't really have that much to show for it, Not, nothing satisfying. Um, and, and there are those who would say, folks like us, I assume, who would say, well, look, one of the things that has cost you is you've taken time away from science and art and civics and all these other things. So uh, I, I don't have a great deal of faith, even though I work for a policy think tank, that we've come up with the right levers to pull uh, to restore you know, civic education to its rightful place and do it well. I mean, to be clear, it's very, very easy to get schools to do things. It's very challenging to get them to do it well. Yeah, should should we focus more on younger grades? Bill? Oh, well, oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. Yeah. I um, think so. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I think I so. Do. I don't yeah. think you're going to get any uh, disagreement um, um, among the three of us or the four of us, including you, because you have a, a, a really powerful role in this conversation as well. Um, I do think it's the, um, because we see so uh, at, the, at the Smithsonian, um, we have, um, specific curricula, um, museum-based education with, um, around American history, and it's um, um, and it really does start from zero to three, zero to six, even, and then um, work its way up. Um, and there's some, um, you know, there's some I think really proven techniques in public history and museum 
um, in the museum field in particular um, that uh, like Bill does in using LA as a classroom that you can really understand, especially getting a student engaged in an object conversation about an object. So it's less about a, a lesson that might be seem ethereal, whether you're you know 10 or 80, um, about some um, kind of far away sense of rights um, um, or, or or wrongs, but uh, about especially about constitutional rights, um, and kind of more about what um, an object from the past that is identifiable, but also can uh, be kind of the connective tissue uh, between. Uh, those lessons, which, and you probably know this, the New York Historical Society is great at this, about sending educators out and bringing that kind of uh, object base or primary source base even, um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, whether it be engagement with um, something tangible or three-dimensional or reading something. Um, you know, for kids, you know, three, four, five hundred years ago for them probably seems like a million. And um, I'm sure 1968 seems like a million. Um, but um, I do, I think we're at our strongest when we can connect back to um, those moments, those objects, those materials, those words, um, um, uh, and, this, and then get to the people of the past. Yeah. You know, what do you think, Bill? Uh, Robert, you want to go ahead and then I, have a, I do have a comment. It's, it's not hard at all, uh, speaking as a teacher, um, to get kids deeply engaged in subjects they're already interested in. The challenge is how do you get them interested in this to begin with? And, and at the risk of seeming um, uh, you know, insubstantial, the greatest gift of civic education in, in the last decade or so, Hamilton, musical Hamilton. You, you know, you had, uh, if you had told me 10 years ago that you'd have young kids, teenagers, singing along in the back of the minivan to, to to that musical and learning, getting interested, getting engaged by the subject, I just said, you're dreaming, not in this country. And here we are. Yeah. There's some, I've, been, I've been so dour, so I'm glad that I can say that one hopeful note. <laughs> I also think it's important to, this is slightly tangential, but you know, when oftentimes we talk about edu our education system, we cleave it at 12th grade, we talk K-12. We need to do a better job of K-16 or K-14 K K you know, further because mm -hmm. You know, part, part of my obligation is to do historical research and to make that research findable and uh, accessible. Well, people that do that need to be in dialogue with classroom teachers who don't have the time uh, or energy to do the kind of archival research that I'm supposed to do. And so enlivening our scholarship uh, or our education vehicles by further connective tissue between those of us at one end of the educational spectrum with those of us at the other end and realizing that we're all educators. We have to do a better job of that. We just have to. Right. And so, Robert, I don't know if you found this, but we've heard a lot of, um, of teachers saying, it's not about that I can't find anything on the web to help me teach X unit of fifth grade, you know, kind of introduction to US history. It's that there's too much. I need, I need it curated. I need it kind of put, you know, put into, a usable form so I can access those primary sources or I can access those photographs. And as, as Bill knows, the, the work that the California Historical Society did on teaching California um, and is still doing is just that. It's like taking archival material and trying then to, to kind of gift it to teachers and students and now teachers, students and parents. I mean, we've spent the past eight weeks at the Smithsonian really thinking about what do these parents need um, parents, you know, who have, who can have an extra laptop at home or parents that, you know, their kids are waiting until they get home from their work. They're sent most of them essential workers and often doing their homework on their parents' phones because that's mm -hmm. the only data plan they have in the house. Right. So there's a, you know, there's so much, I think that this, again, this pandemic's revealed about the, um, the landscape, um, especially of education, um, but then really thinking about ways in which we can help um, families, teachers, and students who are now even more aligned in the educational project than they ever have been. Yeah, those equi uh, equity divides are a real concern for schools right now. Um, so uh, if, you, if anybody has some ideas about how civic education could either help or, or how we bridge those divides through civic education, uh, that might be helpful. Uh, some of our um, uh, 
listeners are asking about that. So, you know, I, uh, combinations of phones and digital devices and not enough devices. And how, how do we do this in this pandemic? Ooh, this, is, this is a Gordian knot. It's really hard to unwind. Uh, keep in mind that much of the problem, we now have multiple generations of students who have been poorly served when it comes to civic and history. So uh, I, don't, I don't wanna say it's the blind leading the blind, but it's very, very difficult to give what you don't have. So if you have teachers who are themselves poorly educated in history and civics, uh, that then that reduces the likelihood that they're gonna be uh, well positioned to, to inspire a love of history and civics, to teach it well th themselves. Um, and I think you made a mention of something which kind of just lit me up and, and at the risk of, of diverting in a completely different direction. I mean, this gets to the heart of the work that I do in education. You mentioned the, the, the problem of teachers thinking that there's too much, not, not too little. That's a serious problem in education. And it's not just in history, it's in curriculum and in, gen in general. We, we, we have tended, and I speak as somebody who went to ed school not that long ago, um, you know, told teachers that, look, it's your job to curate curriculum. It's your job to figure out what gets every student uh, engaged. Uh, we have basically, to, if, if you think civics is the forgotten uh, you know, discipline in American education, well, curriculum is the forgotten lever. We, we don't just don't give teachers mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. they need to teach these subjects well at all. So at the risk mm -hmm. of, of uh, Louise, not just because you're sitting here, uh, but things like iCivics, tools that teachers can use uh, to, to, to really help bring the subject alive are critical because we just cannot ask teachers to do this on, on their own. They're not prepared to do it. So that, I guess that's a one divide that, that we should explore. So there is uh, a role for civic learning outside of the classroom. Uh, you mentioned um, the experience in LA, very deep, uh, the experience of, of curating objects. And then Robert talks about teacher preparation uh, mm -hmm. as being key. Yeah, uh, what what is too. the role mm -hmm. of, of all of those things and, and, mm -hmm. and does it help um, our nation? I think it, oh, I think it does help, yeah, I of so. course. I think it does. I mean, I look at some of these kids we've taught over the 10 years of this service academy and um, we, we would fail if we insisted that what they do with us on any given Saturday is somehow to be divorced from what they do Monday through Friday in the classroom. So asking them to integrate what they've learned experientially into their classroom learning is part and parcel to what we do. And we do think that that's enhancing. I also just have anecdotal evidence of, of students who through this kind of blend of being civic really is what I think they're doing. They're being civic. Um, and that's an important identifier for a young person who's trying to shape their identity. You know, they're 16 years old. And when they come back and I see them when they're collegiate students, a number of them say, I chose this path of a disciplinary or a major, or et cetera, because of what I learned in that program, because of that one day that we worked uh, at the food bank or that we went and saw the wastewater treatment facility or whatever. So, in, you know, it's just like education that we all do it. You never know when you're planting a seed. Do you, do you believe that we should have national service or, or a service component to our education system then, Bill? Uh, mandatory or option? You tell me. I'm not a real mandatory kind of guy. So I would say, <laughs> uh, let's, let's think about uh, an option for that sort of thing or and empower those, it. you know, empower those programs that have contextual richness that may not be served by one single national plan. So I don't know. I sure would like to be uh, part of a brainstorming group to think this one through because I think it could pay all kinds of dividends. Yeah, yeah, I do too. I, I think that then um, going back to what you had said before, the knowing, and knowing teachers in California and now nationally, um, the, um, you know, they're salt of the earth. And as you know, um, Bob, juggling all kinds, especially in the multidisciplinary lower grades, when you're juggling so uh, many demands on you, um, but to really em embrace them, um, even if they didn't learn it or their history education wasn't what we would hope it would have been, um, to really embrace them as, as teaching partners um, and as, um, as thought partners in, in what we do and making sure that the tools that we provide, whether it be it's 
at the Smithsonian or USC Huntington or elsewhere or anywhere um, really match, you know, kind of match with their, not just on a curriculum or a standards base, but really kind of match um, what they feel too that their students need. Um, I love the idea of, of national service. I do think um, I'm with Bill on the um, kind of hard to mandate, but, but interesting to think about how you incentivize it. Yeah. Right, and what that looks like, and and what social goods again to the contract to our great contract that that binds us together, or the Puritans' com common wheel, right, the commonness that that brings us together. What that kind of service and what that kind of learning can do to further, um, you know, those those beautiful, uh, lofty, and challenging uh, and challenged goals. Yeah. Robert. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that. Um, at the risk of um, letting us all off the hook as historians no, and, no, and, keep us on. and educators, something I, I point out all the time is that you know, the, the, the first and probably most important relationship that a child will have with a civic institution in this country is with a place called a school. And as that relationship goes, so go, if you want to bet, all the other ones. In other words, the, the more successful your educational outcome the more likely you are to vote, to volunteer, to be civically engaged by, by all those standard measures. So, so in other words, th this, this should not merely be a conversation about improving, quote, civic education. Correct. You improve civic engagement by improving education at large. Um, mm -hmm. So you know, let, let, let's, let's make sure that we, we don't lose ourselves sight of, of, of the big picture. Um, something I'm very you know, fond of pointing out or, or encourage people to think about is, look, Regardless, uh, it, it, this gets to the point of national service as well. I don't want to be in the business of, of telling children what they should be when they grow up, so to speak, or what they should want. But, but every child's K-12 education should lead to some good end that they're enthusiastic about, about enrollment, employment, enlistment, the, the three E's as, as it were. If, if a kid leaves us at 17 excited about one of those things and, and eager to get on with it, well, then there's a pretty good chance that they are invested in the common wheel, as it were. So that's, you know, that, that is the biggest picture goal. And again, not to let us off the hook, because I want them to be civically grounded as well. Um, but it's really important that we get that, that first important critical relationship with a civic institution, a school, to get that right. Yeah. I agree with that. I agree Thank with that. I think, I I think do. And that learning, we, that love of yeah, learning. If we can help young people to become civic, uh, then their knowledge of civics will follow. And so it's, we don't need to be mechanistic about it in terms of producing yet another um, curriculum that's civics based, although you know, refreshing that's never a bad idea. But I think if we can work at the early end of it to get our students to be aware of their role in civics, the civic and civil society, um, then civics engagement will naturally follow. That's a good place to leave it. Unfortunately, we are rolling down on our time. I tried to address as many of the questions that came in. Um, I will ask you just to each of you, what is one thing you would do uh, to create that loop of uh, feeling uh, bound to uh, civics? What's your one recommendation, Levy? I'll just repeat myself, attachment. The, the job of every teacher is to ensure that every child that leaves us is excited about and attached to some future enterprise in his or her life. I have a similar one, which is uh, uh, belonging, that every student's uh, family and life history belongs to the national story. Yeah, belongs to the national story. Yeah. And Thea? Um, I guess I, I would say, um, Along the lines of, of, of my two uh, fellow panelists for whom I'm grateful to have spent this hour um, with whom, um, I think I would probably say inclusion, which is a bit of belonging and a bit of attachment, right? That, that there is a broad sense of, of inclusion of, of perspectives of, of, of identity um, and the, the breadth uh, and the promise of Again, this grand experiment in how we govern ourselves, which is um, which which takes the kind of constant attention, um, will be I think best served. 
Well, thank you so much. Uh, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today's program. Again, I want to thank the Court Foundation, its president, Michael Boskin, for its support of this program. And a thank you for to today's esteemed panelists, Robert Pondicio, Bill Deverell, and Anthea Hardick. Uh, of course, also thanks to the Commonwealth Club, our host for today's program. The club will soon be posting this video along with other civic education resources on its website at www.commonwealthclub.org. Uh, in leaving you, I'm Louise Juve, the Executive Director of iCivics, and this special virtual program of the Commonwealth Club is concluded. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.